Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. Father, we just love you so much. We thank you. We give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Thank you for a great move of your spirit in our hearts and lives. Thank you for a phenomenal weekend. We're all going to drive home, and here's what we're going to say. We're going to say, wow. Not that the weekend is over. Just wow. What a great things that took place here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. We're grateful, Father, for your presence. We give you the praise. Give you the glory. Bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching here in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will, will give you the praise, give you the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Tonight, just, just for fun, um, remember last weekend I had the privilege of sharing the word of God. And one of the points was to draw near to God. Do you remember that out of the 10th chapter of Hebrews? And drawing near to God, if you remember that, there were three things that God said, let us do. Let us means here's what we should be doing out of the 10th chapter of Hebrews. And uh, let us meant here's what God wants you to do about doing something. Number one was drawing near. Number two was standing strong, if you'll remember that, in the things of God, standing still, being someone who will be a, someone who's consistent in their faithful, as Pastor Luke was talking about this morning, their walk with God. And then thirdly, let us consider others. And if you'll remember, I made some statements, those of you that were here last week, and I made this statement, and it just been hovering around in my heart. I just haven't been able to get away from it. I made a statement that when you draw near to God, you draw near to his power and you need that. You draw near to his peace and you want that. And when you draw near to God, you'll draw near to his pleasures and you will enjoy that. And for all of us drawing near to God, we heard these words, it's something you have to practice doing because your body really doesn't want to do it. Your flesh will try to get you to do something else. Like for an example, for those of you, you, you passed the test with God. You said, man, I've been in church all week long. I'm tired. Maybe you've been in the 12 church services like some of you and uh, the, the previous this weekend, all 12 of them. And here's this last service for the weekend. And you said, I'm just going to stay home, but you didn't. You, you, you made a choice. And that doesn't make the people who stayed home bad. Believe me, I'm not, I don't blame them one bit. I, I actually think they're sometimes a lot smarter than the rest of us. But nevertheless, they stayed home, and we love them, and they're wonderful. But for you, you're, you did something. You, you, you did this, whether you know it or not, as you drew near to God by being here. And when you draw near to God, remember there are some privileges that come with drawing near to God. Because you're now, remember from James, the fourth chapter, James, the fourth chapter said, if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. First step is you draw near to God. So sometimes we want God to be near us. God, where are you? God, where are you? God, I need you. God, I don't understand why you're not here. And when in fact, it's, it, it's, it's you have to draw near to God first. And then the Bible says he draws near to those that draw near to him. In fact, we, we, we saw that those that cry out, God draws near to those that dry, cry out to the Lord. So tonight, I, I want to give you a title of the message, if I may. And it's called, What to Expect in His Presence. Because if you draw near to God, you should expect some things from his presence. If you were here during the weekend... His presence was here. And lives were changed and lives were touched and people were healed. But yet, that's, that goes, there's way beyond that which goes on. What God does when his presence is, is here, it, you could write a 10,000 page book in a minute of what God does to people's hearts if, in his presence. So what to expect in his presence really helps us. Now you say, well, Pastor Jim, where do you get this information? Got it right out of the word of God, where I see God's presence and what took place while his presence were with him. Now you probably go to 40 or 50 things. I'm quickly going to go through a little series of six things, quickly. 
so that when you're wondering why you should draw near to God to, to be in his presence, because you don't feel like it and you're having to press on and you're having to teach yourself to do this and tell your flesh to shut up and you're going to just draw near to God because it's something you practice to do. It doesn't just happen. You practice drawing near to God. People oftentimes practice the opposite, not drawing near to God. They used to draw near to God all the time. They used to come to church. They used to get involved. They used to do those things. Now all of a sudden they, they made this change and now they say, I don't need to do that. When in fact, they do need to do that because it's in his presence. Something happens and we can expect if he did it for these people, he could do it for us. And so as we look at the word, it's very important. What to expect in his presence, number one, is guidance. I don't know about you, but I am lost all the time. I'm one of those people that, uh, I, whether it's business, whether it's family, whether it's choices, whether it's just Debbie asking me, what do you want to do today? I need his guidance in every area. If we're going to do anything for a church, have any kind of a successful church, be any kind of person that accomplishes something uh, along the lines of the heartbeat of God, we're going to need his guidance. We do not guide God, God guides us. And when we try to guide God, like God, come on, get on board. Come on, God, this is what I want. Come on, God, here's what I'm asking you for. And all of a sudden, we're always trying to guide God to our thing instead of us being someone who receives the guidance of God. The one who gets the guidance from God always ends up in the right place, always ends up in a place of blessing always ends up in a place of amazing prosperity. And I'm not talking about just money in your pocket. I'm not talking about just a good job that brings in finances, even though God wants you to have all of that. But I'm talking about prosperity that goes way beyond just economics. I'm talking about prosperity in your marriage, prosperity in your home, prosperity with your children, prosperity with relatives. You know, here's what I, prosperity Seeing your life accomplish what God would have to accomplish. In other words, living a life at the end of your life, man, you have fulfilled what God has you to do. Nothing more successful, nothing more greater wealth than fulfilling the plan of God that God has for your life. And you will never fulfill, neither will I, the plan of God if I don't get the guidance from God. And sometimes, like Isaiah says, it comes at a still small voice that just speaks in my heart and I have to know it's God. And here's God, he's speaking to Jacob. Go with me, if you will, into Genesis, the 20th chapter. And he's, here's God, he's speaking to Jacob. And now he speaks to Jacob. Jacob's running from his brother Esau. You remember the story, he stole his brother's rights. For those of you who don't know the story, it's really a fascinating story. He really wanted to be blessed by his father. And he finds himself in this place where he is literally... Uh, 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 running from his brother and he finds himself, if you will, uh, exhausted and he lays down to sleep at night out in the wilderness. He puts his head on a rock and there God speaks to him when he's quiet. And he has a dream and the dream is so vivid, so true, so clear that you will find that he makes comments and even the dream is recorded in scripture. So obviously it was a very spiritual dream that God wanted us to see into. And God makes this statement in Genesis 28, verse number 15. But I want you to see the statement that God makes for guidance. Watch this. Behold, he doesn't know where he's going, what it's gonna be, doesn't know how it's gonna turn out, doesn't know how he's gonna meet whatever he needs to meet, doesn't realize any obstacles that are ahead of him, doesn't know what the money's gonna be like ahead of him, doesn't know what life, has anybody ever been not knowing what life's gonna be ahead of you? But here's what you need, you need the guidance of God. And God makes this statement to Jacob, I and mean, he makes this statement to Jacob, he also makes a statement to you and I. He says, behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever, don't you love that, you go. I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. In other words, God is with him. God is going to guide him. God is going to bring him back. God is going to take care of him. The guidance is there. So when you draw near to God for his presence, 
May I say this to you? You should expect to get guidance from God. Now, here's, here's what a lot of people do. And here's what I do in my life. I bite off more than I can chew. I'm one of these guys, if God says, build a house, I'm not building a house. I'm building five subdivisions down the road and I'm building, uh, you know, uh, 25 apartments over here and 150 units over here and 500. And God said, build one house. And I know with that out, I got the guidance from God for the one house, but I really don't for the other one. The other one's just wishful thinking. And I find myself oftentimes biting off more than what God says. Can I just say something? When God guides you, oftentimes he only guides you one step at a time. The reason for that is because you can't handle anymore, neither can I. I mean, if God showed me all the things that are going to take place next 15 years, I wouldn't be able to do it. In fact, I remember when God was guiding us to build this building. What we had really done is look for an abandoned uh, uh, Walmart store over here in, in Colton. And it was an abandoned, uh, uh, I think it was a Walmart. Wasn't it a Walmart, Debbie? What was it? Kmart, an abandoned Kmart store over here in Colton. And we, we looked at it and they wanted $5 million for it. We said, oh my goodness, how are we going to come up with $5 million? And, and it didn't work out. We tried and it didn't happen. It couldn't work. But God had given me a, a vision of a larger church in our own building. And we thought maybe that was it. Because here's what, listen to this. We could handle that as a church. Well, we ended up building this building for some $25 million. We would never have been able to build the building that we're in if I had only looked at what I could do that day. And so oftentimes we look, instead of doing what we know to do that day and letting God open the doors for tomorrow, his guidance gets all confused because we add a lot of directions and things to it instead of just listening. What has he told you to do? And he tells him exactly one thing. I'm going to take you to this land. He didn't need to know any more than that. And that's the way it was. Sometimes God speaks to us one day at a time. Take the day and then tomorrow will be another day that his guidance will come. And it comes with his presence. Is anybody listening? <laughs> Number two, we're talking about what to expect in his presence. Well, not only guidance, but I love this word, the word courage. I cannot be go and do what God would have me to be, go and do without his courage. And a lot of times I'm, I'm trying to drum up my own courage. I'm trying to make it happen within myself. I can, I will, I shall, I'm this, I'm that. And God's saying, listen, as long as you talk that way, you void out my power. I'm looking for somebody to look for me to get the job done through him. And this is about when you humble yourself, God gets bigger. And in our weakness, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians, he's made what? Strong. And so we find ourselves oftentimes looking for courage in the wrong places. Courage can't come from who you are and your position. Courage can't come from the money that's in your pocket. Courage has never been designed to come from your education. Courage never been designed to be someone who fits into society or the social system or understands the economics of this country. Courage comes in a relationship with God. And when you get into his presence, he gives you the courage to take that guidance and go do something that you never thought you could do before and get to where you never thought you could ever be and become something you no only dreamt of becoming and never saw it because it's in his guidance that you really adhere to the blessings, get to where you need to be. But it comes from his courage. And in his presence is courage. So in Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter, verse number one, it says, and when you go out to battle against the enemies and see horses and chariots, don't you know I love that message this morning because Luke said, your, your Pastor Luke said you had to be focused faith. We, a lot of times people don't talk about that. 
People say, I have faith, but all of a sudden everything comes in from the outside. Have you ever noticed? I got faith, but boy, I don't feel very good. I got faith, but the doctor's report is it. I got faith, but you know, my bank account says I, I got faith, but you know, I'm not smart enough. I got faith, but you know, there's no open doors. I got faith, but you know, that's for somebody else. I'll do it if it happens, but I, I, you know, there's always an excuse. You gotta have focused faith. You can't let the outside circumstances get you off your faith. And he makes a statement in Deuteronomy 20, chapter verse number one. He says, when you go out into battle against the enemies and see horses and chariots, people more numerous than you, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of them. Why? For the Lord your God is with you, his presence. In his presence is the victory you're looking for in your business, victory with your finances, victory with your marriage. In his presence is victory with your children. Oh my goodness, what could be better than that? What could be better than victory for your life? What could be better at the end of your life, you say these words to yourself. Wow, now that was an adventure. I lived serving God. I wish I had done it since I was a teenager instead of gotten saved so late. And I'm telling you, it is amazing adventure. And the courage you need is because he is the God who is with you. And don't, these people, because they, they were brought up out of the land of Egypt, that was their illustration. But God brought you from Egypt when you got saved. You're not saved, you get saved tonight. Number three. What to expect in his presence, number three. I love this word, security. I, I don't know about you, but I don't function well if there's not some form of security. We do a lot for security, don't we? we? We have jobs, we have retirement programs, we love social security. It depresses all of us to think that someday social security has been stupid with how they invest their money and, and some of you younger generation are probably not gonna see very much of it if you see any at all. And we get really discouraged when the economy is bad. We get really frustrated when there's wars and rumors of wars. And, did you know we're always looking for security? Security only comes to a Christian. Let me make that statement again. Security only comes to a Christian. Let me make it one more time because I don't want you to miss it. Security only comes to a Christian in the presence of God. Doesn't matter what goes on. Doesn't matter who's hunting you. Doesn't matter who's out to kill you. Doesn't matter who's persecuting you. No matter what they want. No matter what they take. In the presence of God, there is security. Let me tell you something. You, even if you're eliminated from this world, you still live eternity in heaven. And you just get to the blessed land before the rest of us. My goodness sakes. God knows what he's doing. Great security only comes from a great God. Is anybody listening? Matthew, the eighth chapter, verse number 20, this interesting little grouping of words. Matthew, the, sorry, the 18th chapter, verse number 20. You got your Bible, make sure you go there. Matthew, the 18th chapter, verse number 20. It says this, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, and I should have highlighted these words, I am there in the midst of them. I don't know, John, if you can do that or not. The back room, I am there in the midst of them. I, I, I miss that. We should, we're my point being is, we're two or three, that's not very many. Security doesn't come from numbers. Security doesn't come from a bunch. Oh, the more of us that gather together, the more secure we are. Security doesn't come from a lot of money in your pocket. Security doesn't come, security comes when you gather in the name of the Lord He's there in the midst of you. And in the midst of you, it's his presence, and his presence is his power, and in his presence is his power, and that's where real security is. Come on, somebody. It's not in the little, it's in the big. So here we're finding out there's some things that we can expect in his presence. As we're in with him, reason why we practice drawing near to God, getting in his presence is because number one, there's guidance. We all need it. Number two, courage. Number three, security. But I like number four. There's comfort. 
I don't know about you, but the world can be upside down. And I just know that I know that I know that God is in control. I hear about the wars. I hear about this group blowing up these people, beheading these people, and how horrible it is. There's no doubt we all hate that. But yet at the same time, there's a comfort on the inside that God knows exactly what he's doing. And may I say this to you? As long as there's a world that refuses to follow almighty God, there'll always be trouble and tribulation and pressures. There'll always be uh, times of of, uh, failure and times of incompetent leadership. There'll always be the Idi Amins that rise up. There'll always be the Adolf Hitlers that come. There'll always be the Mussolinis that come along. And the reason for that is because here's why. Because a people without God can't do anything but fail. And a people without God will bring devastation to themselves. You are only made to find everything, including your comfort, in the very presence of God. Without that, you're looking the wrong place. Someone, someone said, but I tell you what, if we can just find the money somewhere else. Someone just told me that someone in the area just won a big lotto. I think that's great. My prayer to God was, come on, God. You know our church is in San Bernardino, and there's more people buying lotto tickets at this church than anywhere else. I'm only kidding you. I'm kidding you. (laughs) My comfort wouldn't come from anything except his presence. You can have all the money in the world. And be so uncomfortable. Listen, you can be one of the greatest comedians that's ever walked on the planet. You can be an Academy Award winner and numerous times in this planet nominated for Academy Awards. You can be admired. You can win everything. You can possibly have more money than you know what to do with. You couldn't walk into a place without the entire place turning around because you're so talented and so amazingly gifted and end up killing yourself because you have no comfort in life. My friends, you were never designed, your DNA has never been made to find comfort from any other source than his presence. It was only when Adam and Eve were out of his presence They found themselves so discomfortable, they started to clothe themselves and hide from God. Isn't that interesting? Comfort comes from the presence of God. Isaiah 43, and when we get to Isaiah 43, verse number two, it says this, when you pass through the waters, in other words, when there's trouble and pressure, I will be with you and through the rivers, They shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Why? Because he's with us. It's his presence. That's what we can expect, his comfort. He's there protecting us. So today, as we look at the word of the Lord, we're looking at what to expect in his presence, his guidance, his courage, his security, his comfort. And I love this one, his rest. Man, I don't know about you, but I need to be sometimes not laboring so hard, but his rest. In Exodus, he makes this statement, verse 33, chapter 33, verse 14. And he said, my presence will go with you. And here's the promise, I will give you rest. Exodus 33, verse 14. My presence, we're talking about in his presence, what you and I should expect. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. When you go to the work tomorrow, after all week long being in church praising God, sometimes there's a letdown. Sometimes you're discouraged. Sometimes you say to yourself, wow, now, now this is a real world. Can I tell you something? It's not the real world. The real world is in the presence of God. Because it's in the presence of God that you find your rest and your peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And he says, my presence will go with you. When you take him with you to work, don't leave him at home. Don't put him in the back seat. 
Take him with you to work. Can I say something to you? He'll give you a rest. All, men and be like you all day long laying on a couch because you're with the king of glory and in his presence is rest. Come on, somebody. We're talking about what to do, what to expect in his presence. And here's the last one for tonight. We're talking about in his presence, you're going to find guidance. In his presence, you'll find courage. In his presence, you'll find security. You'll find that comfort that you're looking for, and you're certainly going to find the rest. But here's the last one tonight. In his presence, and here's an old man telling you something. Listen closely. In his presence, you will find his faithfulness. And Pastor Luke talked about it so well today. In his presence, you will find, is one thing I can say after all these years, Deborah and I, we've been hungry and we've been blessed. We've been without and we've had nothing. I mean, Deborah, when she, when she had Pastor Luke, we laughed like crazy. We went in the hospital at eight o'clock in the morning. They asked us to leave at 10 because we didn't have any insurance, nor did we have any money. She gave birth to, to Pastor Luke. Of course, he was Pastor Luke at that time. <laughs> Pastor Luke came out, and two, day, two hours later, she and I were home because we were broke and didn't have any money. These kids never had any health insurance ever building this church. If they broke something open, Dad put a Band-Aid on it. He still got scars. He complains about all over his body because boys always did something. I remember going to church and his hand was in the door and I slammed the hand and his fingers were on one side of the door. The door was closed and locked. And his hand was in there. We didn't have the money to run to the... We had to preach the gospel. We laid hands on his hand, asked God to heal him. I said, son, God's going to heal you. i got to go preach. <laughs> He's just a little guy about that big. Guess what happened that afternoon, that morning? He got healed. Never saw a doctor. Sorry, Dr. Kanga. My physician is on the front row. Wave at us all. He's my dearest friend, and I love him. And, uh, but he'll take copay from you. But God will pay you. And there's something different. And it's wonderful. And may I say this to you. Listen closely as I, as I say this to you. You'll find that he's faithful. Matthew 28 verse number 20 says it like this. Teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Isn't that what should we be doing? And lo, I'm with you always. Listen to this. Even to the end of the age. You know, let me tell you, Deborah's mom is having a tough time. She's going to have to go up to Washington. Her dad's having a tough time. They're in their late 80s. My mom is 96, and they're having, she, well, she's having a pretty good time. <laughs> she just doesn't hear very good, and I think that's strategic. She didn't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> and so um, here's what I can say. I'll be with you always. My God says I am with you always. That's his presence. Even to the end of the age. You got to remember that every day when you think you're alone. You don't think you can make it. You think life has passed you by. You got to remember that when you think you've screwed up just too many times. You've been too bad. Made too many bad decisions and been too evil. God in all of his love and mercy comes and floods your life gives you direction. And all we have to do is practice his presence. Drawing near to him, there's blessings waiting. Every day, practice drawing near to him. Get into his presence and he'll get into yours. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Will you do that? <laughs> You don't go to heaven because you're nice. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, tell you the truth. You're not going to get to heaven because you're really good. You're not going to make it to heaven because you say you love God. I asked someone the other day, I said, what makes you think you're going to heaven? He said, Jesus. 
In fact, you're not even going to, listen to what I'm going to say to you. Theologically, I can prove this to you. I don't have time to do that, but I'm going to share it with you. You don't even go to heaven because you think Jesus is the Son of God. That is not going to make it to heaven. I already know you know about Jesus or you wouldn't be here tonight. I already know you celebrate Christmas and Easter, but that does not make you a Christian. In order for you to be a Christian and go to heaven, you're going to have to follow what Jesus says. Jesus went to the cross, a beaten bloody mess, died for you on that cross. Now stop, think about it. So you can go to heaven. Don't you think he'd tell you how to get to heaven in the scripture? Or do you think he just leaves it up to you like whatever you feel is okay and you know, uh, whatever you feel is okay. That's just a bunch of baloney. That's theological baloney. In order for you to get to heaven, Jesus makes this statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen to this, no man goes to the Father except by me. You can try, would be the nicest guy in the world and and memorize the scripture, quote the scripture, debate the scripture, all that stuff, still die and go to hell. You can go to seminary and get a degree, they can ordain you and put you in the head pastor of a church, die and go to hell. There's been thousands over the years who have died and went to hell because you must, Jesus says, John third chapter, Not me, Jesus. You must be born again. When I use the words born again, all of a sudden everybody freaks out. Oh, born again are a bunch of idiots, stupid people, you know, fools or radicals and crazy people. Yeah, that's what Hollywood portrays a born again person like. Can I tell you something? Hollywood has no concept of heaven whatsoever. They have no concept of heaven. And yet we listen to them to tell us how to get to heaven. These are guys that make movies that try to belittle who God is. Anybody that does that has got to be a moron right off the bat. And why do we listen to morons? When Jesus said these words, John 3rd chapter, you must be born again, he was serious. But a lot of people don't know what born again really means, so let me tell you what it means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God's after one thing. Did you ever wonder what this is all about? So that what, I mean, he's going to tell you about God. I mean, how much does he have to tell you about God? Thin paper? I mean, how much does he, it's all about you. He's after your heart and he's after your life. It's about all of your heart and all of your life. It's about a commitment to God, all or nothing. And I'll prove it to you. God forgive us. In American churches, we've missed that for 250 years. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, listen, 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 always will be. I'll prove it to you by the scripture, the words of Jesus himself. In the last book in the Bible, and you've heard of it, the book of Revelation, Jesus makes a statement. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow, what a crude, rude statement Jesus just made. I will vomit you from my mouth? Wow, what he just really said is people who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're gonna get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Lukewarm, what's that? Little in, little out. Lukewarm, little up, little down. Token prayer, lukewarm. Occasional church attendance, watch, here's lukewarm. You're not against God, Uh uh-uh, you're not against him, but you're not wholehearted for him. In other words, he's something in your life. Yeah, God's something in your life, but he's not everything in your life. And by the way, God will never be something until you make him everything. Today, here we are in a safe, friendly place, we've laughed, heard the word of God, we've sung songs. Man, you guys are troopers being here during our 13th weekend service. My goodness, you're amazing. Amazing. But that won't get you to heaven. The only way to get to heaven is you've got to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Notice how I emphasize the word give because he's not a thief to rob it from you. He's not a conniver to talk it out of you. He's not a manipulator to make you do this. It's gotta be a free will choice of your heart. 
And the Bible makes it very clear that you believe with all your heart unto righteousness. Two most famous words is unto righteousness in that whole entire scripture, which most people don't see or understand. It's not just believing with your head. I already know you know that. It's believing so much that you're willing to walk in the things that he has. And the only way you can do that is give him all of your heart and all of your life. Today, you've had a divine appointment with God set before you. You've had appointments with doctors and attorneys and plumbers. You've had appointments with people, neighbors. But here's an appointment God set up for you tonight to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. Somebody would come along and simply tell you the truth. And I love you enough, hey, and I respect you enough, and honor you enough to not play church, but to tell you like it is, and exactly what the Word of God has to say. You gotta give Him all of your heart. You gotta give Him all of your life. You might say, well, okay, Pastor, I hear you, but how do I do that? Well, let's do it God's way, not my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So what did he just say? He just said, if you're willing to make a public statement of your walk and faith with him, he will make a public statement of you to the Father that you belong to him. But if you're not, then he's not going to make a public statement for you. He'll deny you when the time comes. So all across this auditorium, let's do it God's way. I'm a man. I'll see. He said, if you confess me before men, if you've never given him all of your heart, never given him all of your life, in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. It'll sound like this. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up, and I'll see your hand go up, and you can put it right back down. Is that okay? So all I'm going to do is you're going to raise your hand and say, hey, I want to give God all my heart, give God all my life. I want to go to heaven is what you're saying. And I do not want to go to hell. I'll see your hand go up. You can put it right back down. How easy, easy is that? Don't miss it because it's so easy. And today is your day of salvation. Who should raise your hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you have never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. I've never given him all of your life. I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, make sure when you hear my hands pop together. Maybe you prayed with Billy Graham. Maybe you went to a harvest crusade and prayed the prayer. But since when does a little abracadabra magical formula prayer that you quote that God, don't treat him like he's stupid. Here's the prayer. Can you imagine him in heaven saying, oh, they said the right formula of prayer. God, listen to this. He's not stupid. Don't treat him that way. It's not the words out of your mouth. It's a lifestyle you live. He watches your heart to see whether or not your words were serious. And tonight, he watches your life to see if your heart's for real. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm going to count three all across this auditorium. Back in the family rooms, I see you back there. That one's full. And guess what? I'm here to tell you something. Today is your day of salvation. Are you ready? You say, wait a minute, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. The people I came with will see me. The people next to me will see me. I will feel funny. Yep, get over it. It's better to feel funny in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what somebody thinks and sees instead of what God sees. Come on, no one's that dumb. Today is your day of salvation. You should not give a flip what anybody else thinks, only what God thinks right now. Today is your day. I'm counting to three. I've done my job. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Six. Thank you. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. Back over here, there's 11 back in that family room. Go ahead, you can put your hand down. There's 11. Anybody else? There's another one back in that family room, 12. I see that hand back there. Thank you. There's 12. Anybody else that I didn't see your hand? Let me, let me see it. Get your hand up. There's a dozen wise people in here right now. Anybody else that needs to get their hand up, but you didn't get your hand up, but you know you should. Anybody else? I think I saw them back there, Mike. There's just one. Just one, right? Okay, okay, two more. So there's 12 and two, let me see. 14. You didn't know pastors could count, did you? 14. Anybody else? 
There's somebody over here. Hey, 15. I'm doing good. Anybody else? Anybody else? You're going to miss this. Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 white people. Okay. Isn't this cool? All 15 of you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Like Luke said this morning, who's got a coat or a sweater? It's 4 million degrees out. Just get your stuff, get in the aisle, bring me, uh, meet me right up here in front. I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me in front. No one leaves during this period of time because when you leave, it discourages people from coming forward. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on. How can it be? Come on home. He would die for me. Come on home. Come on out of the family room. Come on. Come on, bring your children out of the family room. Come on home. Help them, ushers. I joy you are you. Amazing love. Come on, you come too. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Can it be? You might heal and die for me. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Well, thank God you guys have come. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. Put a smile on your face. You're not going to the morgue. You're getting saved. You're getting right with God. Today's the best day of your life. Today, you get to head to God. I mean, how cool is that? Be a child of God. Listen, you know what? This is full of blessings. It's full of promises. God wants to do great, mighty, marvelous things in the future for you. And uh, we're here to help you. I want you to take a look real quick over here to the left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. He is really a weirdo. And uh, so, no, no. He's a, he's a good guy. He's my buddy. Pastor Joel, no weird stuff goes on at all. He's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you because you need to invite Jesus into your heart. Where you invite him, he'll, he'll lead you in a prayer and you can just receive him. Second thing he's going to do is going to give you some free information. Free. I love the word free. You take it home, read about what to do next. Is that okay? Just about what to do next. That's pretty cool. In other words, now that you're safe, what does God want from you? Very important. So take it home, read it. Do what it says. It's just so simple. Just following that. Just getting back to church. Encourage you to do that. Thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You don't know what that means. It means a friend. Someone will meet you before church service, go over some scripture, encourage you. Now watch this. Pray for you during the week. You need people to pray for you. Because there's no very many people really praying for you. They'll beat heaven down for you and, and uh, beat the devil off your back and help you to keep going. That's what they're made to do. And they are wonderful people. You meet them just a little bit before church service. They buy you coffee, tea, nachos, steak, lobster, whatever you want. And, um, and then you come to church and have a great time. And each time you'll get stronger and stronger until eventually you're the leader of the people you know around you. You'll be blessed and watch it. Am I telling the truth or not? Am I telling the truth? Okay, it just works. Only takes a few moments. So I want you to make a left turn and everybody that waited, everybody came with you, they'll wait for you. Make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. 
I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.